Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Josh and I do a lot of interviews on IT, cybersecurity, education and career type stuff. So today I'm going to kind of start a series doing interview questions and answers that, that is interviews when you're trying to get a job. So I'll kind of start with a bunch of cybersecurity questions and then I'll kind of answer the questions as I would naturally answer them. So maybe that kind of helps. I'll, in other words, the answer is not going to be like really canned and I'm not going to like research the answer that much. I'm just going to try to answer it as as I would answer it. And then I'll kind of talk about each question uh, individually afterwards. A lot of the questions I'll just get from scraping them from the internet and I'll get some of them from my old jobs and I'll pretty much get them from wherever I can. So some of the questions like might not seem that high of quality and that's kind of on purpose just because you may run into something like this uh, in the real world. So the very first question is what is on your home network? And so my answer would be on my home network, I just kind of have a basic Comcast router. That's pretty much the only like main networking device I have right now. I don't have any like switches or extra access points or anything like this. Um, I have my own personal desktop computer, uh, a couple of laptops, a couple of mobile phones, and we, we actually have have a an IoT device, which is just basically a TV that's connected via Ethernet. Running on my desktop, I, I'm running Oracle VirtualBox with a bunch of VMs configured, and the VMs are configured as bridge mode, and they have their own MAC address. So if I were to look on the Comcast router, they would kind of show up as additional devices, but they're just actually VMs on my main desktop PC. So stepping out of answering mode, in my opinion, when people ask this question, they're looking for a kind of a couple of different things. They kind of want to see how technical you are and like how much you actually care about your devices. So if you're someone who just says like, oh, just my like my phone or something like this, they, it might be not a red flag, but you know, typically um, people have like at least some IoT devices or like a laptop or something. So I don't know if you have like a ring, for example, or something like this. It's just kind of a way to gauge uh, to see like what you're cognizant of, because a lot of people are not aware of a lot of the things that are on their network. So just kind of keep that in mind. Even if you don't have like a ring or any of that stuff, it, it's it's okay. In in my opinion to you know make something up just to kind of portray that you're cognizant of those things so like you can like make up an iot device and say that it's on your network it's not like a, a huge sin or anything like that you're just trying to show that you're aware of those things that can be on your network uh, but yeah so the next question is what is the difference between a threat a vulnerability and a risk so basically a vulnerability is just a weakness in any given system it could come in like a lot of different forms so for example like a data center being built on a floodplain. That's that's a vulnerability having been built on a floodplain or a web server that's exposed to the internet that's that's unpatched. So like that unpatched software kind of represents a vulnerability or router setup with default credentials. Those like default credentials are kind of considered a vulnerability. It's just like a weakness in any given system. And then a threat is just basically a negative event that could lead to some kind of undesired outcome as a result of the vulnerability being present. So for example, the vulnerability of the data center being built in a floodplain, there's like a threat of the data center being flooded in and taken offline. In the event of the web server being exposed on the internet with kind of unpatched software, the threat is someone may hack it and then disclose information or or bring the server offline. There's a kind of a difference between like a threat and a threat actor. So in the instance of, you know, the web server being hacked and the information being disclosed, that act of the information being disclosed and whatnot as a threat. And then the threat actor might be like an actual human doing the hacking, or it could be like a bot just scanning the internet with commodity malware or something like this. But yeah, the threat is some undesired event that results from a vulnerability being present. So risk is just basically the likelihood of that vulnerability being exploited uh, by the threats. This question is like pretty important. Um, it kind of will show your fundamental understanding of information security or cybersecurity. And it's really important to be able to differentiate between those three things like the threat, vulnerability, and risk. And you can kind of even take it like a step further and, and talk about how risk is measured, like the, the impact versus the likelihood. And then high impact and very likely means it's like a super high risk and like low impact, not very likely is like a super low risk. And then there's kind of everything in between. So yeah, make sure you like really understand uh, these things, these three things. And the next question is, 
how would you go about securing a server? So for me, it just kind of depends on the environment and the server and kind of a lot of things. But if I'm just using my own personal server and the data on it is not super critical, but I just don't want it to be essentially hacked into, um, I'll probably use something like a CIS benchmark just to kind of do a general security hygiene on it to kind of make sure a lot of the low hanging fruit is taken care of. If you want to get into like real specifics, I might do, I might, you know, do something like make sure all the unused services are disabled, make sure there's like a strong password in use and make sure like a password lockout policy is in use, make sure all the unnecessary ports are closed, this kind of basic things, these would all be covered in the, the CIS benchmark. But if it's for maybe like a defense system or a finance system or like a system storing like electronic protected health information, I would kind of use those, you know, the appropriate standards and guidelines to kind of secure those respective systems. So for example, if it's a electronic protected health information, I might refer to the HIPAA security and privacy rule. If it's like a defense server, I might refer to, you know, NIST 853 or use DISIS like the security technical implementation guidelines. Or if it's a system processing cardholder data, maybe I would make sure that it is, you know, compliant with PCI DSS and then whatever other security controls I felt I felt were necessary to secure it. So it just kind of depends on the system, but just my own system, my own personal server, I probably just use like a, a basic CIS bench benchmark if I were really trying to secure it. This question is like super uh, it's like super open-ended and has like a million different answers to it, right? There's like a million different ways that you can secure a server. So in my opinion, uh, what this question is kind of asking it, maybe, maybe they're trying to get a sense for your, your knowledge about you know, different different standards and like different frameworks you can use to secure something depending on the data that you're trying to secure. So maybe if somebody says something like super basic, like, oh, I'd make sure to like, you know, remove all the default credentials, make sure there's a password. That's definitely good, but you can kind of expand on that and, and say like, you know, I would apply like NIST 853 to it or like, you know, CIS or something like this that kind of shows off your knowledge that you, you're, you're aware of these other things that you can use. So the next question is, why is DNS monitoring important? So DNS monitoring is important because a lot of times once a hacker kind of gains access to a system, they will eventually start trying to exfiltrate data, whether it's like intellectual property or, you know, PII or whatever they happen to find on the system. They need to like exfiltrate it somehow without being caught. And one of the strategies is to kind of exfiltrate data over DNS ports. And the reason for this is generally like DNS traffic is innocuous. It's not something that is always blocked by firewalls or like really like inspected even. It's important to monitor DNS traffic for that reason. And then from another standpoint, it's important to monitor DNS traffic. You don't want your DNS to get poisoned, uh, which will result in hosts looking to, for example, another like malicious server instead of like the intended server. Like if DNS gets poisoned, like whether it's the local cache on the local hosts or the actual server in your network, it's possible to redirect you know, so for example, like hosts pointing to like, you know, corp1.company.com pointing them instead of the original IP address, pointing them to like the hacker's IP address, which is the hacker server. And then the hacker can conduct some kind of man in the middle attack or just intercept traffic in general. So it's important to monitor DNS and that aspect to kind of make sure that hosts are resolving names correctly. So for this question, in my opinion, like the, the DNS monitoring is why is DNS monitoring important? It's kind of hard. Um, I probably would have asked the interviewer, like, like, what do you mean? Do you mean like um, monitoring traffic like outbound? Do you mean like like what part of monitoring do you mean? So it's kind of like open ended. So I pro if I had a human in front of me, I, I probably would have asked them to like elaborate on the question more. But yeah, DNS is like I get how DNS works. I've even like taught it in community college, but it's kind of like there's a lot that goes into DNS, and I'm I'm pretty weak on it. Like DNS sec, I'm like quite weak on that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much how I would answer it, and that's kind of my thought process behind it. I would have probably tried to ask for more from the interviewer, but. Yeah. So the next question is, what port does ping work over? So I would just answer this. I would say like uh, ping doesn't actually use a port. It doesn't use TCP or UDP. It uses ICMP, like the Internet Control Messaging Protocol, and it doesn't actually work 
over any particular port number. So for this question, uh, it's kind of a trick question because if somebody, they might think about it for a second, they might be like, oh, what port does it work over? And then this this question is kind of a trick question. Uh, the, you should just answer it. It doesn't use any ports numbers because if you, if the person being interviewed like tries to like guess and be like port 80 or something like this, it, it doesn't really look that good. It's kind of a trick question. Obviously it's a trick question. It doesn't use a port. Uh, so yeah, just, I guess, make sure you understand ping and trace route and like ICMP. And the next question, and then the last one for kind of this video is, what is the difference between encoding, encrypting, and hashing? So encoding is just basically converting data from, from one format to another. So maybe you convert it to like a string to base64 or something like this. It's not providing any kind of protection. It's just converting it from one format to another. And then encrypting is, the whole purpose of encrypting is to kind of keep data private from specific parties. So when encrypting happens, a key is used, a secret key is used to like encrypt the data the data is like scrambled with the purpose of not being it not revealing the contents of the data to other people and then another key is used sometime in the future to to decrypt it for the appropriate party so they can actually see the data so the purpose of encryption is to kind of protect data and then hashing is basically um, taking some data and running it through some kind of algorithm that produces a digital fingerprint in the end when you hash any given data like no matter how big the the data is or how small the data is the resulting kind of digital fingerprint at the end is like always the same size depending on the hashing algorithm you use it's not for hiding data and it's not for converting data from you know one format to another it's for creating like a unique fingerprint for that particular chunk of data hashing is commonly used to maintain data integrity for example if you were to hash something and it produces a digital fingerprint of one two three and if you hash the same file again tomorrow in the fingerprint is like two, three, four. In theory, you know that that data has changed and then the integrity has been compromised. So this, this question is really good because encoding, encrypting, and hashing are all like super important in information security. And it's super important that you like really understand the difference between those three things. But anyway, that's all I had for this video. I'm going to continue to make a bunch more. So, you know, just keep watching, I guess. If you have any questions or you want to correct anything I said, absolutely leave it in the comments. I read and respond to all comments. And if you correct something, that I did, I'll, I'll probably pin your comment or something like this. But anyway, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.